Today on Studio One, historic movie theaters are in danger. We'll tell you why some are at risk of closing. Also, we'll look at the facts about working out in the morning versus later in the day. And we'll meet a family that travels the country with big bucks. From the University of North Dakota in Grand Forks, this is Studio One. Hello everyone and welcome to Studio One. I'm Monty Cashel. And I'm Katie Fletcher. And thanks for joining us. One of the people we are going to be talking to gets to fly through clouds all the time. That's always my favorite part in an airplane is going through the big fluffy oh, clouds. Oh, definitely. You know, peering out the window and looking out those white, big, yeah. puffy clouds. Except when he goes through them, he's really measuring really precise measurements of certain things. He's actually doing research for NASA while he's doing it. So he's going to come on and we're going to chat with him about all the things they're doing with a special jet that they use. Okay, that should be interesting. Yeah. Also on the show, old-fashioned film is coming to an end in a digital world. Find out why some movie theaters will have to close. And many want to make the world a better place. Later we will talk to a man who teaches others how to create a positive impact on society. Before we get to all of that, here's today's news with Stephanie Shire. Thanks, Monty and Katie. After 32 hours of continuous gunfight, the man suspected for seven murders in France is dead. On Thursday, the police seized the suspect's apartment in Toulouse. The suspect was an Islamic extremist who claimed to be a member of Al-Qaeda. Mohammed Mara was wanted for the deaths of three paratroopers, three Jewish schoolchildren, and a rabbi. He said he wanted revenge for murder of Palestinian children. He also wanted to take revenge on the French army for its foreign intervention in the Middle East. The suspect was by police as he jumped out of his apartment window. Crews in Mexico are surveying homes, schools, and hospitals to gauge the damage from Tuesday's powerful earthquake. The 7.4 magnitude quake struck southern Mexico. The epicenter was located about 120 miles from the resort city Acapulco. Authorities say hundreds of homes are flattened and at least 11 people are injured. No deaths have been reported. Residents felt aftershocks hours after the initial earthquake. Social media websites have a new member to add to their family. The website Pinterest is the fastest growing social media website since Facebook. By using images and videos, Pinterest allows users to pin their content on a virtual bulletin board they create. Then they are able to collect and share their pins with friends and strangers. People use pin boards for many different things such as decorating their home, planning their wedding, or organizing their favorite recipes. It's not just for fun, businesses are joining this trend as well. If somebody is on Pinterest and they don't know about QFM and they're looking through, they're going to see, um, they're going to see something pinned that they like, and then they're going to find out more about the radio station. So absolutely, it's it's great for the radio station. Pinterest does not offer any advertising or paid placements like other social networks. The company says they are investigating business models for a paid service once a solid user base is established. Sharing juicy rumors and spilling secrets is looked down upon by many, but a new study shows gossip might be good for you. University of California, Berkeley found that it could be both therapeutic and prevent selfishness. In this study, participants' heart rates rose when they saw someone behave badly. Consequently, it went down when they were able to tell others about what they witnessed. Spreading the information discouraged them from the bad behavior as well. The researchers say gossip plays a critical role in the maintenance of social order. The flicker of movies may no longer exist as 35mm film is being phased out. Now digital cinema production is coming to a theater near you. The nostalgic ticking of this mile-long reel of film has been projected through this theater's rafters since 1918. The history behind it, you know, it's very historic in the one theater. But that sound may be fading. The National Association of Theater Owners says the future of motion pictures will exist in an all-digital format by 2013. This may be the ticket to clear movies, but at a costly price. An estimated 750 historic theaters currently show movies and may not be able to afford the switch. It'd be a shame if these little places closed up because uh, there isn't a lot of things to do in the area and so a movie is certainly something that we all enjoy doing uh, every now and again. The owners of this theater estimate it will cost a minimum of $150,000 to purchase equipment for two screens. We're going to need um, all new automation, we need new sound systems, 
and we need the new digital projectors to go with it. The switch from film to digital is a daunting task for many small town movie theaters, but this community is embracing the challenge. I'm happy to, that we're switching to digital, I'm excited. The film is a lot of work, it's a lot of, a lot more, you know, the digital you just sit down the computer. And... Digital presentations do not get scratched, fade, or suffer other problems that film experiences over time. But even as the dust settles on these memorable projectors and the film comes to an end, moviegoers can still sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. The Grand Theater in Crookston, Minnesota is the oldest continuously operating movie theater in the United States. And that's the news for now. Monty and Katie. Thanks a lot, Stephanie. Wow, piece of history. Definitely. You know, the flicker of the, as a, the reel goes yeah, around, you know? It just sounds cool. You know, you think of movies, you think of that. <laughs> yes. Well, let's go now to Kellen Peters with the weather news. He's going to talk about how this warm weather we've been experiencing has potential for change. Thank you, Monty and Katie. That is right. You know, all good things must come to an end, right? Right now, we're not sure when that could end, potentially next week. Now, let's take a look at our weather graphic, looking at exactly what is going on. Now, what we've been facing recently is this flow pattern. And basically, with our warm weather, we've been... I'm going to talk about what the process exactly what is going on. Now, we've been seeing a lot of cold air coming down from uh, Canada, and with that, I'll run these low pressure systems over the Rockies. And with low pressure systems, they move counterclockwise or cyclonic flow. And with that, it's kind of with a paddle wheel effect and rotating counterclockwise, and it's bringing down a lot of cold air. And with that, the system has been moving very slowly to also stagnant. And when over time, it's been giving it the air to warm up and with that it's been moving over with these high pr pr high pressure systems actually Bermuda high is coming off the Gulf of Mexico and with these high high pressure systems are actually rotate clockwise or anti cyclonic flow and with that it's actually a lot of warm air and that's where we're actually seeing all that warm temperatures and that and the March Madness effect going on with a lot of very nice temperatures now how long is it going to last well some models are actually cranking out that this flow could actually be changing towards a typical march of what we should be expecting. Now actually, what, is, what this could mean actually uh, later on at the end of March is with this paddle wheel flow, what I've been talking about, is on the back side of these low pressure systems, it actually brings down this cold air and that is where North Dakota, South Dakota, and Minnesota could see some colder temperatures. Now when I say colder, don't jump out of your seats too much. What I mean by that is around 40 degrees so actually the average temperature for the month of March is actually the low 30. So moving on to our next graphic, you can see it's still going to be above average. However, overnight it could be a little cold around that typical March temperatures. Now out west still it's a little colder with what has been going on with the airflow. Now as for seeing any, uh, any rain across the air, United States, it's really been the same areas as it's been all year continuously. Over from Maine all the way down to Texas and up to Minnesota and North Dakota is still seeing, uh, could still potentially see rain. And out west too is uh, still very uh, wet. However, down the southwestern part of the United States and our southeastern part of the United States, it's going to, uh, excuse me, see, could see some moisture in there. Now, as for our weather question of the week, it is about how many record temperatures have been tied or broken across the U.S. this March? Is it uh, 350, 900, 1,500, or actually more than 2,000? You know, we've been breaking a lot of records so far, Monty and Katie, and it, it could be interesting what more is just around the corner. All right. Thanks, Kellen, with that weather news. Thank you. Yeah, there I, it seems like records are falling all, all the time. Right, and those were some high numbers. Very so high numbers, I, I would guess say. Guess we've got a lot of records yeah. broken. We'll wait for that answer later in the show. It's time now to see, uh, we've got some highlights lined up in hockey. John Schaefer. Thanks, Monty and Katie. Athletes recoup from injuries and muscle soreness in many ways. Some use ice bathing to help them recover. Some may prefer cold instead of hot by using the ice bath to return to full health. A study at the Ohio State University of Sports Medicine shows that athletes who take ice baths reduce soreness by 15 to 20 percent compared to those who did not. Ice bathing is used mainly for recovery from sprains and stressed muscles. Professionals say when using an ice bath after an injury, the sooner the better. It keeps that swelling to a minimum and if you can do that, you recover quicker, you get functional quicker, especially if you do it within the first 48 to 72 hours. Westering says the ice baths are used almost year-round. He says they use it at a minimum of 50 degrees, colder than the, that could cause shock to the body. 
It's now time for the Studio One Sports Trivia question. What is the lowest seeded team in the NCAA Men's Basketball Tournament to ever win the national championship? A good plethora of schools there that have had great history in basketball. We'll get to that later in the show, and that's the sports. Monty and Katie. Thanks, John. The film The Hun Hunger Games is set in a future war-torn North America. Young people are selected to fight to the death on live television. We'll preview the movie based on the popular book. Also, when you earn something, it can be hard to give it away, especially when it comes to money. Next, we'll meet a man who educates others about sharing their profits. The University of North Dakota School of Medicine and Health Sciences is meeting the challenge of future healthcare workforce shortages. The state's only medical school produces the highest percentage of graduates nationwide who choose family medicine. Advanced degrees are also offered in basic medical sciences like anatomy and health professions like physical therapy. Students learn and train throughout the state. In that way, we really are North Dakota. Make your choice the UND School of Medicine and Health Sciences. At the University of North Dakota School of Engineering and Mines, improving the world is our project. This could be your next road. Our research helps heat your home without hurting the environment. You drink clean water because of my work. We push technology to improve quality of life. This field could fuel your car. Petroleum production can be more efficient. One day, my ideas will impact you. I am. I am. I am an engineer. Accounting at the University of North Dakota is more than just numbers. It's about maintaining a history of high quality education and developing leaders in the accounting profession. While numbers stay the same, the UND accounting program continues to evolve. UND hosts one of the country's best accounting programs and now offers a master's degree in accountancy. Accounting at the University of North Dakota. Numbers accelerated. Studio One is a television show produced by students at the University of North Dakota. You can be a part of the graphics team, the marketing team, news team, programming team, production team. Training never ends. You get to produce guests, you get to do the reporting side of it. It's really worth the experience. You will not regret it. Help others live to their full potential. Improve clients' mental and physical well-being. Excel in one of the top healthcare careers of the future. Occupational therapy students at the University of North Dakota experience high quality education in small classes. You have to come to 45 degrees, okay. even in a normal motion pattern. Your healthcare career begins at the University of North Dakota. You're watching Studio One, twice named the best college television show in the nation by the National Association of College Broadcasters. There are hardships in society that must be faced every day. The awareness of these problems makes up a person's social consciousness. Associate Professor of Public Administration Jason Jensen is here to talk about the importance of this awareness when starting a business. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. Thank you for inviting me. So you developed this new course about social entrepreneurship. Could you tell me a little about, about that? Well, uh, it's actually a, it's a graduate certificate, and um, it's comprised of four courses. And the courses all relate to social entrepreneurship uh, or social enterprise. And so the idea was to create an opportunity for students uh, after they graduate with a bachelor's degree to pursue this uh, subfield of nonprofit management and entrepreneurship called social entrepreneurship, which is uh, recognizing a problem in the world and then using entrepreneurial principles to resolve the problem. Uh, and, and so it's four courses and it's newly available this semester uh, for post back students. How has your background kind of helped you develop this course? Well, my background uh, was in nonprofit management. I was the uh, director of a treatment facility for adolescents. And, and then I went back for, for graduate education and got my PhD in public administration. Public administration is very related to nonprofit management. And when I, uh, I got my first job here at UND, I developed a course in nonprofit management. 
and, and then I uh, had been teaching that for a while and a student came in my office one day and, and gave me a book and said, you have to read this. And that book was by Bornstein, How to Change the World. And so I read that and I was inspired and I would invite a lot of, you know, every, anybody else to read that book as well. Um, and one thing led to another and I integrated uh, that into my nonprofit management course and then I began to develop the certificate in, in uh, social entrepreneurship. Okay, so that's kind of how you wanted, decided to create this course. What do you hope to accomplish through it? Well, uh, my goal is to be entrepreneurial myself and to educate students so that they can go out in the world and, and resolve social problems. And so I see it as universities are supposed to be in the business of creating social capital. And we do that all the time. We send students out and, and, and they contribute to the world. But uh, I don't know that we do enough of it in, in that we don't really equip students necessarily with the specific skills that would allow them to start a business um, or contribute to an existing nonprofit in a way that's entrepreneurial. And so I really see it as making the world a better place. So you've mentioned, yes, yeah, students kind of being able to go out in the real world and make a difference. What are some like, specific examples of how students can, you know, um, gain from going out in the real world? Well, uh, I, as I see it, they could start a, a social enterprise. And a social enterprise is, is, a, is a business with a social mission. And so it's not, it's, it's not unlike any other business except uh, most businesses uh, in the private sector will have a profit motive, whereas um, a social enterprise will have a profit motive, but the profit goes toward resolving a social problem. And so um, Tom Shoes is an example where every pair of shoes they sell, they donate a, a pair of shoes. It's, uh, um, to, to needy people in other countries. So it's the one-for-one one pledge that Tom Shoes has, and that's a wonderful example of uh, a social enterprise, and the founder of it was a social entrepreneur. Okay, so just kind of, you know, taking other people into consideration in the world. Um, through this course, there's a topic of social consciousness. Why is this important? Well, again, I think as a university, we have to be in the business of creating um, socially responsible citizens. And, and so we serve the state of North Dakota, and I'm not saying that the students we graduate aren't socially conscious, but I think we can do more to contribute to that. And then once they graduate, no matter what field they're in, if, uh, if they've had, had been exposed to social enterprise and social entrepreneurship, then I think even if they move into the private sector, that social mission idea will always be in the back of their head and if they have the opportunity to create a social enterprise or to um, establish a social mission in an existing organization, that makes the world a better place. Uh, and then the nonprofit sector as well, that if uh, students choose to work in the nonprofit sector, well, all of those organizations already have a social mission um, and, and, and so they would be instituting entrepreneurial principles into nonprofit organizations, which is also good. Is this approach to social consciousness different now than in the, the past? Uh, I don't necessarily think so. I think the United States has a very rich history of nonprofits, and, and that's a good thing. But um, at times, the nonprofit sector, the third sector, hasn't really been as entrepreneurial as possible. That is, they depend on charity rather than um, finding alternative mechanisms to raise revenue, such as selling a product. And so that's sort of the bridge from the traditional nonprofit non tech sector to the entrepreneurial nonprofits and then to the social enterprises, which aren't nonprofits, but they're uh, private businesses. Before we go really quickly, how can these organizations help to foster social, social change? Well, uh, by raising revenue that keeps the organization going to support their social mission. And so all of these organizations will have a social mission. Uh, that's what makes them different from a traditional business, which they don't have a social mission. And it, it might be that that's the entire mission of the organization, or it might be part profit motive and part social mission. Uh, and again, the, the upside is that uh, the world's becoming a better place if more people uh, think like this. 
Okay, thanks so much for joining us and talking about this course you have developed. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Coming up, some people prefer to get it done first thing in the morning. Others embrace their energy late at night. Find out the debate about the best time to exercise. Also, hunters enjoy the hunt for the perfect buck. We'll meet a family man who turns this enjoyment into an inspirational message. Studio One closed captioning is underwritten in part by Options, your disability information source. What does cancer look like? What about diabetes, heart disease? Medical laboratory professionals are a vital link in the treatment of disease and maintenance of health. They investigate clues found in the body that will direct patient care. The University of North Dakota's laboratory science programs are some of the most innovative, far-reaching, fully accredited programs in the nation. The UND School of Medicine and Health Sciences can help you become one of the few who see beneath the surface. It's not the size of the woman in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the woman. This is a place where innovation abounds. A place where dreams come true. A place where creativity is a way of life. A place that fires our soul. Join us for the North Dakota Spirit Campaign. Together, we will shape the future of UND and North Dakota. A new sci-fi movie is poised to be the blockbuster of the year. Hunger Games is set in the ruins of what was once known as North America. 24 youngsters are picked to take part in a televised fight in the fictional nation of Pan Am. Only one of them will survive. The main character in the film is a 16-year-old played by Jennifer Lawrence. She volunteers for the games after her baby sister is drafted. The film shows her fight for survival through trust, love, and humanity. She's got a pretty great life um, under the circumstances. She's, she's happy, she likes to hunt. And then she gets, her little sister, who's 12, gets chosen for the Hunger Games. The film is based on a novel written by Suzanne Collins. The novel has sold more than 26 million copies in the U.S. alone. When writing the novel, Collins was inspired by classic sci-fi writers like George Orwell. She mixed in the contemporary obsession with reality TV. Hunger Games is rated PG-13 and will be in theaters March 23rd. Now it's time to take a look at the events happening in your area. <music> Kids are used to hearing about the importance of staying out of trouble. We met a man who put a living twist on inspiring kids. At this sports show, there are some displays that score more points than others. And one could wonder what all these people are fawning over. I'll introduce you to Wiley at one, <laughs> Wiley at five, right? I can, we can do this all day long, show you just how fast they grow. To some spectators, they may look like a couple of men with deer. But to Steve Porter and his sons, these deer are more like family. The favorite one on the trailer is probably this one right here, Storm and Norman. Nearly 20 years after starting his business, Steve says it has become more than just raising deer. 
Before the hunting season even begins, Steve and his sons hit the trails traveling to schools across the Midwest, and their message goes beyond the simple thrill of hunting. Youth are important, and we want our youth to be actively involved in the outdoors. Just this year, that's all we have. Steve's background is in law enforcement. He says his deer help inspire students to find an outlet to have fun without breaking the law. We know that kids who wear camel coats and kids who are out setting up goose decoys at 6 in the morning probably aren't going to be breaking into a pot machine at 3 a.m. Even while influencing other people's kids, Steve remembered to impress values on his own. I wouldn't miss it for the world. It's been the most exciting thing I can th possibly think of. Now it's a business, it's paying for itself, it's making you know pretty good money, but, it, but if we took all of that away and all I had was uh, my boys actively working and enjoying this farm, it would, be, it would be worth it just for that reward. So whether it's sitting in a classroom or up in a tree stand, Steve encourages students to aim for success. With photographer Devin Krinke, this is Olivia Fox reporting for Studio One. The Porter family has 46 deer on their farm. Only three of those deer, Shifty, Redwood, and Storm and Norman, travel with them. Coming up, climate change over the last 30 years has caused a change for gardeners. Find out the new guidelines for planting and why some regions are excited. That story plus news, sports and weather in the next half hour of Studio One. Closed captioning for Studio One is underwritten in part by NDAD, helping others to help themselves. If this tennis ball represents today's environmental challenges and these puppies are the EERC, then tackling those challenges is just another workday. At the EERC, we're improving air, water, and soil quality, developing renewable fuels, cleaner power plants, and discovering new ways to use our natural resources. And just like those puppies, we'll never tire of the pursuit. EERC, putting research into practice. Help others live to their full potential. Improve clients' mental and physical well-being. Excel in one of the top healthcare careers of the future. Occupational therapy students at the University of North Dakota experience high-quality education in small classes. You have to come to 45 degrees, okay. even in a normal motion pattern. Your healthcare career begins at the University of North Dakota. This is a place where innovation abounds, a place where dreams come true, a place where creativity is a way of life, a place that fires our soul. Join us for the North Dakota Spirit Campaign. Together, we will shape the future of UND and North Dakota. Your future depends on this moment. Take the path that leads to your future. From the University of North Dakota in Grand Forks, this is Studio One. Welcome back to Studio One. Thanks for joining us today. So there are a couple of different types of mothers out mm, there. Uh, yeah. You know, there's moms that just let their child do whatever they want. And then the opposite. Exactly, the hoverer. Yeah, I think they call those helicopter mothers. Helicopter mo mothers. Mothers, yeah. Yep, that, you know, just need to know where their child is at all times. Mm -hmm. Well, we thought it would be interesting to go out and get your thoughts, you know, on the experience you've had with maybe an overprotective mother, you and know, or maybe you think it's just part of a mother's nature. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we have some interesting answers coming up for you in the next 30 minutes on Studio One. We've got some other stories as well. They're in every car, can cost up to $1,000 to replace, and thieves can steal them in under a minute. Find out what car park thieves are targeting. Also, Slam Poetry is all about hearing the spoken word. We'll meet a man whose life events inspired him to perform poetry for others. And NASA is more than space shuttles and satellites. We'll talk to a man who works on a NASA research project, but stays within the atmosphere. But first, here's today's news with Stephanie Shire. 
Thanks, Monty and Katie. The shooting of a Florida teen nearly a month ago has now captured the attention of people on a global scale. Trayvon Martin was on his way to his father's fiancé's home, holding nothing more than a package of Skittles, when a local neighborhood watch captain shot and killed him. The gunman, George Zimmerman, had called police to report suspicious activity. Zimmerman told police he was merely acting out of self-defense and was not arrested. But now millions around the world are speaking out. Petitioners are calling this a hate crime, arguing Zimmerman shot Martin because he was black. Now people are calling for Zimmerman's arrest and even the resignation of police chief for not arresting him the night of the shooting. Residents of a small Wisconsin town are trying to figure out what caused loud explosion-like sounds. Clintonville, a town of 4,200, reported loud popping noises and ground shaking during the night. The problem started the night of March 18th around 3.30 in the morning. Police and utility crews have checked homes, sewers, and power sources, but were unable to come up with any leads. Geologists confirm a minor earthquake occurred near the city. Officials are still trying to determine if the sounds are related to the quake. Laundry detergent can't stay on the shelves, but it's not because people are buying them out. Thieves are trying to make a clean getaway by stealing Tide from stores. Tide is the new hot commodity being stolen around the nation. Thieves walk into a store, fill their cart with Tide detergent, and walk out, often putting other toiletries on top to make it less noticeable. Law enforcement are calling the detergent liquid gold. They say the thieves trade the detergent in exchange for drugs. Then drug dealers sell the Tide to small retailers for less than wholesale. Some stores are taking measures to minimize this theft. CVS is even putting Tide behind the counter or locking it up. Your morning coffee can have a bigger pick-me-up than you think. Most people know that caffeine can affect our sleep, but research shows it actually depends on your daily routine. In a study by Stanford University, researchers found that early birds who had a cup of coffee during the day were more likely to wake up during their night's sleep. The night owls, however, were very little affected by caffeine. The study was done on college students. The researchers say the reason for the difference might be because night owls can be so sleep deprived that they will sleep through the caffeine. Grand Theft Auto is the criminal act of stealing someone's car. Automatic locks and alarms can help prevent this sort of crime. However, these devices will not protect against thieves stealing a particular car part. Nothing's faster oh. than taking that off with a sawzall. All around the country, people are startled at the sound of their car when turning on the ignition. Your once nice sounding car would sound similar to a tractor or a grain truck. This is not the result of your car breaking down, but instead, the theft of a particular part. Catalytic converters are being targeted by criminals due to the precious metals found within the car part. Somebody who knows what they're doing and knows what they're looking for, um, it can be a real fast crime. Thieves are after the platinum, which can be resold for a lot of money. I think people always continue to find creative ways to make a living, either honest or not. And uh, if they're able to get under a car and get a catalytic converter out in just under a few minutes and get away with it and make a profit at it, they're probably going to try to do that until they get caught. A catalytic converter is located under a car next to the muffler. Usually it only requires, you know, making two, maybe three cuts that you can do in under 30 seconds. It is harder for criminals to steal converters from smaller vehicles with less ground clearance. Particular cars may be at high risk because what they offer is a higher reward. Certain vehicles contain up to five, uh, particularly Fords. Although your car is functional without the converter, it is a federal law that each car has one. Every vehicle made after 1981 has one and is required to have one. If the next time you start your car it sounds like a Harley Davidson, it's possible your catalytic converter was coveted. I'm Corey Robertson reporting for Studio One. The mechanic we talked to says that replacing a catalytic converter can cost anywhere from five to seven hundred dollars depending on the car. And that's the news for now. Monty and Katie. Thanks a lot, Stephanie. I guess uh, they'll think of anything, right? To make right. money. I guess you'll have to get those really low riding cars. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> They'd have to jack your car up to get it. Right. Well, let's go to Kellen Peters now with the weather news. He's going to talk about how, you know, the first day of spring brought some windy conditions to certain parts of the country. That's right, Monty and Katie, it really has. You know, actually parts of Texas, specifically Divine, Texas, they actually uh, went through some tornadoes, actually. And the, as you can see, it would damage a lot of homes and actually a lot of debris went on. Now, there's only five injuries and no deaths. However, actually, the Sheriff's Department actually recorded over 300 calls of 
issues that happened. So it's interesting actually what happened. The storm was caused by an upper level system followed by a dry line. So it's interesting um, looking exactly what, ha or excuse me, dry line, not squ uh, squall line actually, and that is with tornadoes. Now what happened actually is this cold front came through and before the cold front, that's where that squall line was. That's where the tornado was produced. And with that, it's actually over a million dollars in damages. And there are three tornadoes in this area, all from a single supercell. And the winds were up to 110 miles an hour. So it was a pretty devastating, or a tornado to do some damages. Now, anytime there's a tornado, generally they come from a funnel cloud, which is usually around behind the system. However, uh, if there's any tornado warning or you see a tornado, you do not want to be outside. It's, remember to seek shelter immediately away from windows. You do not want to be a spectator for this weather phenomenon. Now, while spring weather it has been occurring, it can be a positive for gardeners, actually. With winter behind us, many people have one thing on their minds, spring planting. Very eager. Yeah, it's been a nice winter, but it's never soon enough to get out there and plant. Most gardeners know what plants they should be growing and when. Experts say despite the warm temperatures, people should still wait till the right time. If you plant too early in the spring, uh, the, the, the ground is too cold yet. But for the 82 million household gardeners, the right time has changed. This year, the U.S. Department of Agriculture updated the plant hardiness zone map. The map is the standard used to determine which plants are most likely to thrive at a location. This is the first update since 1990, and many gardeners say it was long awaited. Spring feels like it's coming earlier and earlier every year. USDA zones are based on measurements from the National Climatic Data Center. They calculate new U.S. climate normals every 10 years. Reclassifying a gardener's yard into a warmer area opens new options for planting different flowers and shrubs. Thanks to the new guidelines, plants can boldly grow where they've never grown before. With photographer Matt Petroviak, I'm Karen Protasio, reporting for Studio One Weather. Now with the weather this year, it is going to cause some planters to actually what they are able to plant in the ground this year. Now it brings us back, now with spring weather, that brings us back to our weather question of the week and about how many record temperatures have been tied or broken across the United States this March? Is it 350, 900, 1500, or more than 2000? With the answer, at more than 2000, actually, 2052 actually, and still counting. So Monty and Katie, hopefully that trend still keeps on continuing. I agree. Thanks, Kellen, for that Thank weather you. news. Thank you. That is a lot of records being broken. It really is. But the good kind. For sure. Right. It's nice warm weather. Exactly. Okay, let's turn to sports one last time and John Schaefer. Thanks, Monty and Katie. It's no secret that obesity is a serious problem in the U.S. Experts say diet and exercise is the only cure, and some wonder the best time of day to burn calories. At 7 a.m., many people are getting out of bed, while others are already feeling the burn. I like coming in the morning because there's not as many people. It's been a long time debate over what's better, working out in the morning or at night. Fitness experts say there are benefits to both. If it's for general fitness, any time of the day, just make it a part of your daily life. Research by the University of North Texas found that it's different for each person. People's daily cycles that regulate body temperature, blood pressure, and metabolism are all unique. Some might feel more energized in the morning during a workout, while others feel stronger as the day goes on. The researchers also say a person's daily cycle can be reset based on behavior. It really doesn't matter what time of the day you work out, as long as you're making that time to do it. The time of day for exercise may be a personal preference, but feeling your body is not. Food is your fuel, and in order to um, be able to do the things you want to do with your workout, you're going to need to fuel yourself in the right ways. Fitness experts say if you don't eat before working out, you may not reach your full potential. It's recommended to not work out directly after a big meal, but not an empty stomach either. A light snack 30 minutes before is the perfect amount. I usually just have a little bit of fruit before I come so I don't have as much breakfast in my stomach when I'm here. So no matter if you're up at the sunrise or running in the twilight, it's not what's most beneficial. It's what's most beneficial to your schedule. I'm Chelsea Grover reporting for Studio One Sports. One thing most fitness experts agree on is to not exercise right before bed. It can interfere with, 
with a good night's sleep, which is crucial to effective workouts as well as performance in other areas of life. Now the answer to this week's Studio One Sports Trivia question, what is the lowest seeded team in the NCAA Men's Basketball Tournament to ever win the national championship? The answer is D. Villanova in 1985. They beat Patrick Ewing in the Georgetown Hoyas 66-64. That's the sports, Monty and Katie. All right, thanks, John. Mothers are notorious for their watchful eye. We wanted your thoughts on if you've experienced the overprotective mum or you believe they are just doing their job. Your answers are still to come. Also, slam poets want their poems to be heard rather than seen. We'll meet a poet who travels around the country to spread his words. If this tennis ball represents today's environmental challenges and these puppies are the EERC, then tackling those challenges is just another workday. At the EERC, we're improving air, water, and soil quality, developing renewable fuels, cleaner power plants, and discovering new ways to use our natural resources. And just like those puppies, we'll never tire of the pursuit. EERC, putting research into practice. Your future depends on this moment. Take the path that leads to your future. Studio One is a television show produced by students at the University of North Dakota. You can be a part of the graphics team, the marketing team, news team, programming team, production team. Training never ends. You get to produce gas, you get to do the reporting side of it. It's really worth the experience. You will not regret it. At the University of North Dakota School of Engineering and Mines, improving the world is our project. This could be your next road. Our research helps heat your home without hurting the environment. You drink clean water because of my work. We push technology to improve quality of life. This field could fuel your car. Petroleum production can be more efficient. One day, my ideas will impact you. I am. I am. I am an engineer. Here's a shot of our large studio audience, including a group from Crookston High School in Crookston, Minnesota. Yeah. There are many ways to express yourself through the way you dress, what you say, and much more. One man chooses to express himself through something called slam poetry. It's a process, an involuntary function by which lung muscles expand and contract fact. The human body can't survive without oxygen. Slam poetry. It's different than many other forms of writing. It's a performance where poets get the chance to spar with others. Asia is one of the best. I love it because I get to write something, tell how I feel. It could be bothering me, you know, whatever could be bothering me or whatever I just feel inside. And then you let it out. Asia is a slam poet from South Florida who travels around the country telling his story and painting pictures for young people with his words. There are times when I do shows and it just feels like, man, I could be up here for three hours and you just feel alive, you know, and you feel it. That I love the most. Not every poem can bring happiness and laughter. Asia says that many of the things he faces are things other people face as well both the good and the bad. There's never a proper response when you're sitting at the doctor's office as he proceeds to tell you those are cancer cells they found in your body. People used to come up to me all the time saying like, Asia, we love you, we'll be there for you, and I knew they meant it. But at the end of the day, it was still me that had to face it. For Asia, along with the challenges of the disease came a crucial life lesson. If you love everything that you're doing and this is your life and you're living it, you're gonna look back and say, man, it was worth it, you know? With photographer Dog Amdam, this is Avery Hagasog reporting for Studio One. Asia has won many awards for his slam poetry performances. He was also featured on television channels such as BET, HBO, and performed with numerous major recording artists. 
Most of us have seen moms that hover around their kids at any given time. The term helicopter mom is used to describe this behavior. Parenting.com recently wrote that it can lead to problems like depression and anxiety. We wanted your thoughts on what some, some might call overprotective moms and what others might say is just part of mother's nature. My mom is really overdramatic about everything. I can't even go to the bathroom without her bugging me. I was the first girl in my family, so my parents were really protective. We learned how to work because we lived on a farm and my brother worked to the outside and blah, blah, blah. Once I moved out, I realized how much there's actually to do at a, in a home. It probably won't end and that just means she loves me, right? Today's kids, I think, get more done for them, but they get more done for them in schools and everywhere else. It isn't just at home. She's constantly trying to figure out who she is because her mother's always right there telling her who to be. I know a mother that used to just dote on her child, you know, just like, what do you want now and what would you like to eat? A comment from our Facebook page from Bismarck, North Dakota. Lindsay says, at age 24, I find it a little overbearing when my mom still licks her fingers and smooths down my hair. <laughs> from time to time, people send us videos from their computers. We had a web video comment from Burnsville, Minnesota. Um, hovering to a certain extent is necessary. Uh, it seems like there is always uh, a cold look I'm getting because I'm not handling my daughter properly uh, when she's acting out at a grocery store or not handling her silverware correctly at a fine dining restaurant. But once I think kids get to a certain age, um, parents should uh, back away from it a little bit. Plane passengers rarely make note of passing through a cloud. We'll talk to a man who purposely flies through clouds no matter what the weather conditions are. Closed captioning for Studio One is underwritten in part by the Listen Center, where meeting friends at Listen is a groovy thing to do and has been since the days of Woodstock. What does cancer look like? What about diabetes, heart disease? Medical laboratory professionals are a vital link in the treatment of disease and maintenance of health. They investigate clues found in the body that will direct patient care. The University of North Dakota's laboratory science programs are some of the most innovative, far-reaching, fully accredited programs in the nation. The UND School of Medicine and Health Sciences can help you become one of the few who see beneath the surface. It's not the size of the woman in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the woman. This is a place where innovation abounds. A place where dreams come true. A place where creativity is a way of life. A place that fires our soul. Join us for the North Dakota Spirit Campaign. Together, we will shape the future of UND and North Dakota. Despite the research that goes into it, weather can be har a hard thing to predict. The University of North Dakota Department of Atmospheric Sciences has a research jet that's being used to gather information for NASA. Tony Granger is here to talk with us about this jet and what he does with the organization. Thanks for coming on the show today. Hey, great to be here. And I mentioned the jet in the introduction there. It's a Cessna Citation II research jet. That's correct. What, what is this jet used for? 
Well, the Cessna Citation II is a commercial airplane, but this particular one we have modified significantly to handle a lot of instruments and measurements that we want to take. A large number of those are in clouds. Okay, and so what do you do on the plane? I generally am the flight scientist, uh, and that means that I take copious notes of what it is that we're flying through and occasionally they ask for some sort of decision about what to do next and, and, uh, and that's where I would come in. Well, how does someone get into this? How did you fall into this? <laughs> well, I don't really have a very good answer to that. Um, I've, I've started off in, in meteorology and, and worked uh, for a number of years in uh, weather modification programs and experimental programs basically and, and these required the, the, the measurement of the cloud properties to and tell if it was the clouds were suitable for, for cloud seeding. And that's one of the biggest things that you do uh, when you're in the air is you're measuring things in the clouds, correct? That's correct. Okay. And why is this developed, the, the research yet to go up? Why is it so important to do that kind of research? Boy, there's a lot about clouds that that we just don't know, and and globally, uh, we have a fair number of measurements now in over the U.S., but we have, in essence, no information about clouds in other parts of the world, and especially places uh, like in equatorial regions, uh, there are very very few measurements uh, of the cloud properties. And one of the things that's probably not very appreciated is that if you were to take the wa liquid water in a cloud and change the drop size distribution by just a little bit, 10%, that would completely overwhelm the effects due to global warming and carbon dioxide. Okay. So this is really an important, <laughs> important yeah. aspect. Well, and important enough to have NASA backing up the research. Um, what is this latest... Uh thing that you've been studying up in Canada, actually? Uh, the one up in Canada was the, uh, uh, what is it, GPEX, Global Cold Season Precipitation Validation Experiment, I think is the, is the proper, proper name for it. But we were looking at um, the, what, what NASA tries to do is remotely sense what's going on in the clouds, how much precipitation is falling, for example. You mean remotely from satellites? Exactly. Okay. And so they have these satellites that are flying over, they're looking at these clouds, and yeah, it looks like a cloud, but what else? Sure, and, and what, you with the jet can go through the cloud. We can go through the cloud, we can make the measurements, we can tell how rapidly that cloud is processing water, how rapidly that water is falling out as snow. So we can, we can make a lot more uh, informed, uh, decisions on what what that cloud really is doing sure. than they can do with the satellite, but but they do have some guesses by the satellite. Yeah, and we have we have pictures of of the plane and and uh, and what is on the plane. Uh, obviously, uh, this is a picture up in Canada um, with the snow at the time, and the next picture is of the instruments. And when I saw this, I noted right away that there was ice buildup. Is that a normal thing? It depends upon the type of clouds that we're going at, and this particular experiment was lake effect snow primarily. Okay. And there is generally a fair amount of liquid water content in those clouds, and it's below zero degrees Celsius, so it hits the airplane and it freezes. Are you trying to fly through inclement weather? Oh, certainly. So when you see a storm happening, that's a good research opportunity. It's a good research opportunity with some exceptions. Sure. Um, one, one of the things that we don't want to fly through is a hail shaft. Sure. Uh, we go to great pains to try to avoid that. Yeah. But liquid water content, super cool liquid water, icing conditions, our airplane is de-iced. So, so it is, it's, it's not like we're a bunch of cowboys out there trying to get yeah. adrenaline rushes. Right. Uh, we're, we, we, we do this with, with a little caution. Okay, and uh, there's another plane that you work in conjunction with as well. It's a DC-8, it's a much larger plane. Uh, we have some video of that. Uh, 
I've seen the inside of the Citation looks really cramped, uh, not a lot of space. This one, however, um, it's it's a passenger jet. Oh yeah, a DC-8. That's what that's they flew passengers. This it, and you you could even I could walk down the the aisle in there without having to stoop over or crawl. Um, and the DC-8, I mean, it's got it's got big engines, it's got lots of space, it's got hot and cold running water. I mean, <laughs> it's it's got just lots of facilities, and it can carry a big payload. I have to ask you this, lastly here, what gets you still excited about doing this research? The, it's fun. It is really fun. How many how many meteorologists get to go up and actually dwell in the medium that they're 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 studying? So instead of looking at the clouds, you're going through them. That's right. <laughs> All right. Exactly. Well, Tony, thanks so much for coming on today. It was very interesting talking to you. Well, it was good to be here. All right. Well, you're watching Studio One from the University of North Dakota. We'll be back right after this. The University of North Dakota School of Medicine and Health Sciences is meeting the challenge of future healthcare workforce shortages. The state's only medical school produces the highest percentage of graduates nationwide who choose family medicine. Advanced degrees are also offered in basic medical sciences like anatomy and health professions like physical therapy. Students learn and train throughout the state. In that way, we really are North Dakota. Make your choice the UND School of Medicine and Health Sciences. This tennis ball represents today's environmental challenges, and these puppies are the EERC, then tackling those challenges is just another workday. At the EERC, we're improving air, water, and soil quality, developing renewable fuels, cleaner power plants, and discovering new ways to use our natural resources. And just like those puppies, we'll never tire of the pursuit. EERC, putting research into practice. At the University of North Dakota School of Engineering and Mines, improving the world is our project. This could be your next road. Our research helps heat your home without hurting the environment. You drink clean water because of my work. We push technology to improve quality of life. This field could fuel your car. Petroleum production can be more efficient. One day, my ideas will impact you. I am. I am. I am an engineer. What does cancer look like? What about diabetes, heart disease? Medical laboratory professionals are a vital link in the treatment of disease and maintenance of health. They investigate clues found in the body that will direct patient care. The University of North Dakota's laboratory science programs are some of the most innovative, far-reaching, fully accredited programs in the nation. The UND School of Medicine and Health Sciences can help you become one of the few who see beneath the surface. Tune in next week on Studio One. We'll meet a man who collects antique slot machines to show and sell. Plus, we'll have other news and entertainment stories for you. Can't go wrong with puppies. We're going to leave you with pictures of dogs and their owners enjoying the early spring weather. From all of us here at Studio One, have a great week. <laughs>